Welcome, story lovers, to Storytime Haven. In a hidden village where spirits walked and seasons clashed, a girl named Oksana held the key to an ancient power. From whispers in the snow, to the roar of the fire, join her on a journey of magic and mystery, where a battle for balance will ignite the world. In the village of Lesnaya, nestled against the ancient forest, I was Oksana, the girl the snow spoke to. Not in words, but in the flutter of flakes on my outstretched hand, the chill patterns that bloomed beneath my bare feet. The others, they felt the winter's bite, but I felt its secrets. That was before the gifts. One morning, a scream shattered the crisp air. On Vasilisa's doorstep lay a carved bird, feathers burnt as if by unseen fire. On old Mikhail's step, a horse of pure frost shivered into melting. Fire and ice, whispers of a power none understood, Fear slithered into our village like the twisting roots beneath the forest floor. Then came Father Constantine, his eyes like chips of flint. His sermons echoed not with the warmth of his Savior, but with warnings against the old ways, the spirits my grandmother whispered to, the domovoi who wept unseen in the hearth. He pointed to the gifts, calling them devil's work. But when I asked, what of the frost, Father, does it not bear the same otherworldly touch? The kindness in the villagers' eyes turned as cold as the winter sky. The forest, once my sanctuary, whispered louder now. Not snowflakes, but a taut silence, like the moment before the wolf lunges. My grandmother's hands shook as she left offerings the domovoi wouldn't touch, her muttered prayers hanging heavy in the air. I became a shadow in my own village, the girl touched by uncanny things. Yet, one night, under a moon fat and pale, I could deny the forest's pull no longer. Guided by a force I couldn't name, I walked past the flickering candlelight in the village windows, into the waiting dark. There, something impossible happened. The snow, it didn't just fall. It glowed, etched with strange, swirling symbols I half understood, like the forgotten language of the earth itself. The preacher, Father Constantine, arrived with the first thaw, his black robes seemed to suck the light from the retreating snow, and his eyes, they weren't the warm brown of Father Alexei, who died the previous winter. These were hard, like the glint of an axe blade. Each time the church bell tolled, it felt like a blow to my spirit. My grandmother's worry was a physical weight, in our hut. Her offerings to the domovoi went untouched, and his whispers, once a gentle background murmur, had turned into an anxious hiss. The forest my forest, felt wrong. The usual crackle of life was replaced by a tense silence, like the world was holding its breath. News of the fire and frost gifts spread like wildfire. Every day I'd hear tales of another village, another strange marking, but no one could make sense of it. Then, the whispers about me started. The girl who hears the snow, they'd say, casting sidelong glances. I became a shadow in my own home. Yet, under the gibbous moon, a pull I couldn't name tugged at me. It wasn't fear, nor quite courage, but something primal. Armed with only a heavy cloak and my frayed trust in the forest, I slipped past the watchful eyes of the village and ventured into the trees. The snow beneath my boots glowed, not reflected starlight, but a light from within, swirling with symbols I could almost read, like a language buried deep in my bones. The ache in my hands wasn't from the cold, but from the magic swirling in the frigid air, demanding I reach out, touch it. Deeper I went, the glow growing brighter, until I stumbled into a clearing bathed in an eerie, moonless light. In its center stood a ring of stones, each one etched with the same symbols, pulsating with icy power. Was this the source, the reason for the forest's unease? Just as I decided to return with Grandmother at first light, the air split with a shriek, a whirlwind of snow and feathers exploded from the stones, and when it subsided, there stood a woman. Ice glittered in her hair, and her eyes held the frozen fury of a winter storm. My breath caught, frozen in my lungs not by the cold, but by the sheer wrongness of her. The woman, no, the creature, shimmered with the unsettling beauty of a blizzard. I stood rooted in place, half in awe, half in a terror that prickled under my skin like a thousand icy needles. She didn't speak, simply observed me with those impossible eyes. Yet somehow, 
I knew. I wasn't merely facing another denizen of the forest, powerful though she was, but something different. A spirit of winter itself, raw and untamed. Finally, she moved, not with human fluidity, but with the crackling jerkiness of a breaking ice flow. She reached out one ice-sheathed hand, and a snowflake landed on my bare skin. I didn't flinch. It didn't melt but flared into the same swirling symbols that pulsed in the stones, etching a searing cold into my palm. Chosen, she rasped, her voice the groan of glaciers. Not a question, a statement. Chosen for what? I managed to choke out. Her smile was a jagged crack in a frozen lake. Service, purpose, power. Each word fell like an icicle, sharp and heavy. The balance, tilts. You will be the weight on the scale. My head spun. What balance? What scales? Fear warred with something else. A flicker of defiance born of the same wild spirit that sang in the winter winds. And if I refuse, my voice barely a whisper now. Again, that terrifying smile. The forest will burn. The rivers will choke. Your village. She trailed off, but the threat hung heavier than any snowfall. Her terms were clear power with a devastating price. My grandmother, the villagers, the forest itself, their fate in my hands. It was more than any one girl should bear. Yet, as I looked into that creature's eyes, I saw a reflection of the storm building inside me. Tell me what I must do, I said, my voice surprisingly steady. A bargain was struck that night, born of desperation and the ancient magic humming beneath my skin. My task was cryptic, the price hidden in the swirling symbols. I stumbled back to the village at dawn, marked by frost and the weight of a terrifying new destiny. Father Constantine's sermons grew harsher, his eyes burning with that relentless fire whenever they settled on me. My grandmother watched me with a mix of worry and a strange, desperate hope. The domovoi had gone silent, retreating to the darkest corners of our hut. The forest, my once beloved sanctuary, now felt heavy with suspicion, as if I were the intruder and not the creature of ice. Sleep became an agonizing game of dodging nightmares, not of the winter woman, but of fire engulfing the village, of frozen rivers that coughed up black sludge. Every waking hour, I wrestled with the runes left branded on my skin, their meaning as elusive as smoke. One afternoon, drawn by a pole like the tug of a fishing line, I found myself not at the forest's edge, but by the river. Its usual rush was muted, replaced by a low, unsettling gurgle. As I neared the bank, something glinted under the surface, not ice, but a dull, oily sheen of green and black. A dead fish floated belly up, its eyes filmed over. The river is dying, an unfamiliar voice rasped behind me. I spun around. An old woman stood there, wrapped in layers of ragged shawls. Her eyes, ringed with wrinkles like ancient tree bark, were the startling clear green of river moss. Who are you? I demanded, fear and curiosity battling in my voice. A keeper of things the village folk choose to forget, she cackled. But you, ice-touched girl, you remember, or at least, your blood does. She thrust out a gnarled hand. Let me see the mark. The Winter Queen's bargain always leaves its trace. Hesitantly. I showed her my frost-etched palm. She ran a calloused finger over the symbols, muttering in a tongue I didn't know but felt echoed in the ache of my bones. The task. It's tied to the water, she finally said, her voice grim. To the old ones who dwell below. This is why your forest cries out, why the domovoi hides. Old ones, I echoed. Rusalki, she scoffed at my confusion. Spirits of the drowned, fickle and dangerous as the river itself. The winter creature seeks to rouse their wrath, to use them as her icy army. Your task, girl, is to soothe them, to find their stolen heart before all is drowned in frost and tears. My world tilted. The bargain, the forest's unease, the river's dying gasps. Suddenly they snapped into a twisted kind of focus. Rusalki, the tale's grandmother used to tell by the fire came flooding back. Maidens wronged and reborn their laughter like treacherous rapids, their tears as deadly as a winter flood. But to be an instrument of the winter creature, pawns in her war, it sent a shiver down my spine that had nothing to do with the cold. Stolen heart, 
I pressed the old river woman. What do you mean? She cackled, a sound like stones rattling in the current. Brusalki are born of grief, bound to what sank them. Their heart, it's not flesh and blood, child, but some precious thing, lost to the depths. Calm the grief, return the heart, and they quiet like summer storms. The task seemed impossibly vague, yet a desperate certainty settled over me. The river was my guide. Each gurgle and ripple spoke a language I was only beginning to decipher. That night, the icy symbols on my hand thrummed with an impatient heat that chased away sleep. When the moon rose high, a shape etched itself against the silvered water. A weeping willow, its branches dipping into the current like skeletal fingers searching for something lost. Following the river's direction, I waded into the icy shallows, the shock of the cold a jolt that cleared my head. The riverbed beneath my feet wasn't smooth stone, but littered with fragments. Broken pottery, tarnished coins, a child's wooden doll missing an eye. Each object throbbed with a strange, hollow echo. Then, my fingers brushed against something smooth and round. With trembling hands, I pulled it free, a locket, crusted with river grime. Inside, not a portrait, but a single, perfect river pearl. As the locket touched my skin, a song rose from the water. Not words, but a haunting melody of despair and longing. A Rusulka wail. It shivered through me, and with it came a vision. A young woman in a tattered wedding gown, her laughter swallowed by a sudden surge of the river. The first piece of the puzzle. And with it, the grim certainty that there were others, countless others, trapped in their underwater grief, ripe for the winter creature's poisonous whisper. The villagers eyed me with greater suspicion than ever. I was no longer just the girl marked by strange magic, but the one who haunted the riverbank at night, who spoke in murmurs to the sickly current. Father Constantine's sermons took a dark turn, hints of demonic possession and the need for purification barely veiled. Yet, under the cloak of darkness, I became a scavenger of sorrow, guided by fragments of mournful song and flashes of half-drowned memory, I waded into the icy river. Each object retrieved, a rusted sword, a lock of tangled hair bound with a faded ribbon, was another key to a Rusalka's torment. One bleak dawn, after retrieving a child's broken music box, I collapsed on the riverbank, shivering and drained. As dawn painted the sky in streaks of weak pink, a figure emerged from the pre-dawn mist, not a villager, nor the river woman, but the creature of ice. Anger flared hotter than my fading strength. What right do you have to do this? I rasped, to turn their grief into your weapon. Her smile held no warmth, just that same desolate beauty of a frozen wasteland. Lil' human, you understand nothing. There were already weapons forged in sorrow. I merely offer direction. To destroy, I spat back. To reshape, she countered. This world of yours is soft, rotting at its core. It needs the sharp clarity of ice, the relentless truth of winter. Her words were a blizzard in my mind. Part of me recoiled in horror, yet a smaller, wilder part whispered of the stagnation choking the village, of the desperate fear rotting it from within. Before I could untangle the turmoil, she was gone, leaving only a swirl of icy mist in her wake. My encounter with her did nothing to resolve the battle waging in my soul, but it did harden my resolve. There was no dealing with the winter creature, only defying her. That night, a different figure materialized from the gloom. The river woman crouched beside me, her green eyes flashing. News travels on the current, she croaked. You oppose our icy queen. A wise choice, or a foolish one, time will tell. I couldn't let her. I stumbled over the words, not wishing to reveal how close the winter creature's arguments had come to hitting their mark. Let her turn grief to rage, the drown to destroyers. The old woman finished for me. Then, she thrust a bundle of rough cloth into my hands. Take this. It will shield you from their eyes. For a time. With that cryptic farewell, she vanished. Trembling, I unwrapped the bundle. A cloak woven from river reeds and starlight, shimmering with a strange luminescence. My fight had taken a turn into the shadows, a war waged beneath the notice of the fearful villagers and the ever-watchful eyes of authority. Fear became my constant companion, not of the Rusalkas, 
their songs of sorrow now held a melancholy familiarity. But of Father Constantine and the villagers his fiery words ignited. Their gazes burned like hot coals on my back. As I passed through the dwindling market, their whispers a sharper sting than the icy wind. The river became my domain. The cloak the old woman had gifted shielded me, not with total invisibility, but with a blurring of my presence to both human and spirit eyes. By day, I gathered what the river yielded, each object thrumming with its own sad refrain. By night, I sought their spirits, drawn by their keening songs. Returning these lost, waterlogged treasures was not a simple act. The Rusalkas were creatures of contradiction, sorrowful yet vengeful, bound to their watery graves yet yearning to break free. A carelessly returned memento could incite wrath instead of peace. I had to learn their individual stories, offer not just the object, but understanding. Some were soothed with a gentle word, a whispered echo of their lost love or stolen joy. Others, others demanded a price. A lock of my hair, a drop of blood freely given, a tear shed in sympathy. Each sacrifice chipped away at me, blurred the line between helper and victim. Late one night, tracking the source of a particularly haunting melody, I found myself not at the river's edge, but deep in the heart of the forest. The Rusulka here was different, her song edged with fury, her form twisting amidst the skeletal trees. Her stolen heart, it became chillingly clear, was not an object, but a wolf, its mournful howls mirroring her own. The hunters, she hissed, appearing as a mist-formed woman with eyes like green ice. They took my brother, for sport, for his pelt. Her watery form began to churn. I will tear them limb from limb, drown them in their own blood. This was no gentle spirit yearning for peace, but a creature twisted by rage into a weapon ripe for the winter creature's use. I couldn't return what was lost, but perhaps I could offer balance. Your vengeance will feed the frost, I said boldly. It will make you her servant, not free you. Her form wavered, the snarl fading. When she spoke, her voice was less a hiss, more a desperate sob. What else is there? That night, under the indifferent stars, we laid a trap. Not with snares and weapons, but with a sacrifice, a deer, swiftly slain, its blood a beacon in the silent forest. The hunters, lured by the scent, found their easy prey. Their shouts of triumph turned to screams as the Rusulka rose from the mist, not to tear them apart, but to lead them on a terrifying chase, deeper into the woods. They fled at dawn, leaving their weapons behind, and the echo of a wrath far greater than their own. Victory tasted of ashes, exhaustion gnawed at my bones. Every villager that looked away, Every flinch at my passing was a new wound. Yet, with each Rusulka soothed, with each mournful song quieted, I felt something within me shift. It wasn't just defiance now, but a cold, bright certainty. They wanted to cast me as a demon. Fine, let them fear a demon with a purpose. My connection to the winter creature deepened uncomfortably. Her presence was a splinter of ice in my mind, her whispers woven into the howl of the wind. I began to sense her movements, the locations where her power solidified, twisting the natural world. One such place was a lake, deep in the forest. For days, its stillness had been an anomaly amidst the chaos. Now, it pulsed with a wrongness. Venturing to its shores, I recoiled. The ice wasn't a smooth sheet, but a grotesque sculpture garden. Frozen birds with outstretched wings, deer trapped mid-leap. Even the skeletal forms of wolves, jaws locked in silent snarls. This was her demonstration of power, a brutal masterpiece for the villagers to stumble upon. My task became painfully obvious. It wasn't enough to undo her influence over the Rusalkas. I had to break her creations, free the trapped spirits. The ice burned my hands, each crack sending a jolt of pain and alien energy up my arms. But, as I worked, I felt another presence rising to meet the winter creatures. The old river woman materialized beside me. She drains the life, freezes the very spirit of your forest. She rasped, you break the ice, I will draw out the echoes. Together, we might weaken her hold. The work was slow, grueling, and laced with danger. With each spirit the old woman pulled into herself, she grew paler, 
her voice fainter. By the time we reached the wolves, their eyes gleaming with icy malevolence, I could barely hold the chisel steady. Yet, we persevered. As the last wolf form shattered, a shriek split the air, not the old woman's, but the winter creature's. Her rage was a psychic storm, lashing at my mind. Then, abruptly, it retreated, leaving a ringing silence in its wake. Collapsing onto the cracked ice, I turned to the old woman. She slumped beside me, not in exhaustion, but in finality. I held her back. For a time, she whispered. The echoes. They are part of me now. Part of the river. Her form shimmered, became watery, and dissolved into the thawing lake. Grief and triumph warred within me. Another sacrifice. Another debt added to my impossible task. The world felt colder, and not just because of the lingering winter. The winter shouldn't have lasted this long. The sun held a watery strength. Icicles dripped a mournful rhythm, but the cold that seeped into the village wasn't natural. It was a reflection of the winter creature's icy heart, beating in time with my growing despair. Each dawn felt like a new battle, against the villagers' fear-hardened gazes, against the gnawing exhaustion, against the whispered temptations of the creature in my mind, offering power, order, the sharp clarity of ice. Each night, I slipped into the forest, or waded into the chilling river, my resolve a shield against the encroaching frost eating at my soul. The change came suddenly, not with a blizzard, but with smoke. I was returning a love token to a rusalka in a willow-draped inlet when I heard the screams. Sprinting through the trees, heart pounding, I emerged to see flames licking at the thatched roofs of my village. Not a natural fire, no accidental hearth left untended. These flames pulsed with a malevolent blue light, dancing to a tune the winter creature hummed in the back of my mind. Father Constantine stood amidst the chaos, not directing the terrified villagers, not offering prayers to his god, but shouting accusations. The witch, he cried, pointing a shaking finger at me as I stumbled into the square. Her demonic work. She has brought this wrath upon us. The villagers, primed for weeks with his fear-mongering, turned on me. It took only one hurled stone, one cry of burn her, to ignite the tinderbox of their terror. I could have run, disappeared into the forest, but a cold fury burned away my own fear. This was her game, break my spirit through isolation, then offer herself as the only salvation. Well, I wouldn't play. I raised my chin, the icy runes on my hands blazing in the unnatural firelight. Yes, I shouted, my voice clear and strong above the din. It is my work, undoing her work. I pointed towards the forest, the heart of the winter creature's power. Chaos erupted. The villagers, caught between terror of the fire and terror of me, milled in confusion. Father Constantine shrieked announcements, but his certainty was cracking. Then, drawn by the commotion, a single figure strode into the square. My grandmother, frail but unbowed, pushed her way to my side. This child heals the river, she proclaimed her voice surprisingly strong. She quiets the spirits. Without her, the winter will swallow us whole. It was the spark that shifted the tide. A few voices rose in my defense, hesitant at first, then bolder. The fire raged, but the flames of accusation targeting me began to gutter out. The fire ravaged the village, yet in its destruction, something changed. The whispers against me quieted, not out of newfound trust, but from a desperate, fearful uncertainty. Father Constantine retreated to his church, his fire and brimstone rhetoric replaced by muttered prayers. Perhaps he sensed what I had long known. His God had no power here, only the old forces at war in the forests and rivers. The winter creature's influence was waning, her power bleeding away with each spirit I unbound, each act of defiance. Yet, she was far from defeated. The ice clung to the forest stubbornly, and she still whispered insidiously in the wind, tempting me to take the easy path, to embrace the raw might she offered. Then, one night, her voice became a demand, a clearing deep in the forest, untouched by either the village fire or her frost, pulsed with energy. Drawn by an irresistible force, I walked into its heart. She awaited me, her form shifting between the ethereal beauty of a snowdrift 
and the monstrous silhouette of a spined, skeletal creature. You have served your purpose, she rasped. The air crackled with barely restrained power. Now, kneel. I could have, dropping to my knees, surrendering to her icy dominion, would finally bring peace. Of a sort, the forest would lock into eternal winter, the village would bow to her, and I would wield a power colder than any frost. Yet, as the choice hung heavy in the air, something snapped within me. No, I declared, my voice echoing in the charged clearing. You want a servant. You have the villagers cowering, and even the most powerful among them whimpering. Me, you will never own. Her fury exploded, a whirlwind of ice and fury. I didn't raise shields, didn't beg for mercy. I stood, drawing on a well of defiance I barely knew I possessed. The icy blast slammed into me, not with crushing force, but as an invasion of my very being. Her essence sought to entwine with mine, to freeze my heart from within. The runes on my skin blazed with searing heat. Ancient, forgotten knowledge I carried in my blood fought back. Not a battle of magic against magic, but spirit against spirit. I was a girl of the village, touched by both warmth and wildness. She was winter incarnate, beautiful and merciless. When the storm subsided, I still stood, though my knees trembled. The winter creature stared, her form flickering in frustration. You are insignificant, she hissed. Your defiance is a guttering candle against a blizzard. Maybe, I retorted weakly, but candles brought your fire to the village. Candles touch the old woman to the river, and a candle warms a hearth against the longest night. Before she could respond, I fled. I didn't know if I'd won, if I'd changed her, merely delayed her, but the encounter left me with something priceless. Not power, but certainty. My path lay not in dominance, but in preserving the fragile, flickering warmth of the human world. I returned to the scorched village, not as a pariah or a savior, but as an uneasy necessity. The frost lingered, the Rusalkas sang their mournful melodies, and fear still gnawed at the villagers' hearts. But now, a sliver of desperate respect mingled with their dread. My grandmother fussed over me, her touch hesitant. We both bore the scars of that night, me with the fever that followed the winter creature's icy touch, she with a new frailty. In those bleak days, as winter bled reluctantly into a hesitant spring, it seemed the only warmth between us was from the ever-burning hearth. It's not done, I rasped one morning, my voice raw. Grandmother sighed. I know, child. The balance, it's still broken. I need help, I admitted. The words bitter, something older, wiser than me, something more in tune with the forest. Her gaze sharpened. You speak of the bear? I'd heard whispers, tales from before Father Constantine's arrival. Of the ancient bear spirit, slumbering in the deepest part of the woods, dreaming of summer's past. Some called him God, others protector, but all agreed. You didn't seek the bear, the bear chose you. The forest, which had been a place of terror, under the winter creature's influence, now felt strangely still, awaiting something. Armed with a hastily packed bag, and more courage than sense, I slipped past the watchful eyes of the village and ventured deep within. I didn't find the bear in a grand cave or moss-laden clearing. Instead, at the heart of a tangle of ancient, skeletal trees, I stumbled upon a simple hut. Smoke curled from the chimney, and the air thrummed not with winter magic, but with a quiet, earthy power. Before I could knock, the door swung open. Standing there was a figure swathed in furs so thick, it was hard to tell where human ended, and Bear began. A booming voice echoed from within the shadowed hood. So, the ice girl seeks warmth at last. It wasn't a question, but a statement of fact. Yet, surprisingly, I felt no fear, only a weary sense of rightness. This was where I was meant to be, though why, I couldn't fathom. Help me, I managed to say. Then the world tilted, and I crumbled into darkness. I woke not to the softness of my palate, but to the rough weave of a bear hide blanket. My fever had broken, leaving in its wake a deep ache and an even deeper disorientation. I sat up slowly, my gaze falling on a fire blazing, not in a hearth, but in the center of the hut. 
The bear sat on the other side, a shadowy, bear-like form amidst the flickering light. Why? I asked, my voice barely a rasp. Why help me? Balance. He rumbled, his voice like the creak of old branches. The ice seeks to drown the world. Your fire gutters, both, must survive, dance their ancient dance. He spoke in riddles, yet something in his words resonated with a truth I'd been struggling to grasp. I wasn't the savior of the world, but one small part in a cycle far older than myself. My task was impossible, beautiful, and perhaps a little bit foolish. For days that blurred into weeks, the bear taught me, not with spells or incantations, but with the language of the forest, the scent of soil before rain, the low hum of life beneath the snow, the shifting weight of sunlight through the canopy. He taught me of the old ways, the spirits not as servants, but as partners in a delicate, intricate dance. And, most surprisingly, he taught me of the fire hidden in my frost-marked veins, a spark inherited not from the winter creature, but from my own ancestors, keepers of the hearth, singers of warmth into the darkest night. You carry both, the bear said one evening, the fire casting long shadows across the hut's earthen walls. Embrace the ice, but do not be consumed by it. Nurture the flame. The final part of my training was the hardest. I stepped out into a clearing ringed with stones, each carved with a symbol echoing the runes on my skin. This, the bear explained, was a place of power, an echo of the winter creature's domain but tied to the earth, not her icy will. As the sun sank, I closed my eyes, summoning her essence. The familiar, insidious cold crept into my veins, the whisper of dominion in my ear. Yet, this time, I didn't fight it. I breathed it in, let it mingle with the warmth thrumming in my blood. For the first time, instead of discord, there was a strange, shimmering harmony. When I opened my eyes, a delicate frost pattern swirled across the ground, but at its heart glowed a tiny, defiant flame. I returned to the village a stranger, not the outcast, not the potential savior, but something other. The villagers still flinched at the sight of my frost-marked runes, but their fear was now edged with a flicker of awe. Even Father Constantine, emerging from his shaken retreat, regarded me with a mix of consternation and a grudging respect. My task now was twofold, yet intertwined. I walked the riverbank, seeking the heartbroken Rusalkas, not just to offer their treasures, but to teach them something new. Sorrow was natural, a part of the cycle, but it shouldn't fester into vengeance, shouldn't become another weapon in the winter creature's arsenal. By sharing stories of my own grief, by kindling a flicker of defiance within them, I turned them not just from wrath, but towards healing. The forest, too, felt different under my touch. Not as a hostile force, but as a cautious ally. With the bear's teachings still echoing in my mind, I learned to coax, to negotiate, not to demand. Small offerings left on ancient roots brought gentle shifts in the winds, guiding me to where the winter creature's taint lay thickest. Then, under the fattest moon, I'd venture into these places of lingering ice, not with confrontation in mind, but with creation. My frost would weave delicate sculptures, shimmering and ethereal, yet within each, I nurtured a tiny heart of flame, offerings of impossible beauty and gentle warmth, gifts to entice the winter creature into dispelling her own blight. One night, after leaving such an offering at a frost-choked waterfall, I felt the change. A warmth spread through me, welcome and startling after so long attuned to the ice. Turning, I saw the winter creature, not in her monstrous form, but as a woman of moonlight and snow. Her eyes, always like frozen chips, held a flicker of confusion. Curiosity, you defy me, yet aid me, she murmured. I seek balance, I replied, my voice clear and strong in the night. The winter needs the warmth of spring to give it meaning just as the fire needs the coolness of autumn to prevent it from consuming all. She shimmered, her form wavering. Such concepts are meaningless in my realm. But you are here, I countered, gesturing towards the forest. Your power bleeds into this world, touches it, changes it. You are already part of the cycle, whether you wish it or not. For a long moment, only the hushed sounds of the forest filled the clearing. 
Then, with a last flicker, the winter creature vanished, leaving behind a sense of potential, a fragile maybe hanging in the air. The first thaw came not with the watery warmth of usual spring, but with a strange hesitation. Fragile shoots battled soil still touched with lingering frost. The river gurgled with the dissonance of both icy whispers and hesitant birdsong. It was as if the world paused, holding its breath as I made my preparations. The bear had guided me to a secret, the true purpose of the winter creature's markings upon me. They weren't a brand of ownership, but a key. My role was never to defeat her, but to reforge the connection between her frozen realm and the world of the living, a connection damaged over long, forgotten centuries. Armed with this knowledge, yet burdened with uncertainty, I ventured once more to the stone circle the bear called the heart of the wood. Villagers watched from afar, their whispers a low hum of mingled fear and desperate hope. Even Father Constantine watched, not with righteous fury, but with a flicker of vulnerability in his shadowed eyes. My work wasn't a grand incantation, but a series of gestures both simple and profound. I touched each stone, murmuring not spells, but names. Of the villagers, of the Rusalkas I'd soothed, of the bear himself, and even the winter creature, as cold and alien as she was. I marked the ground around the circle with delicate frost spirals, then nurtured a ring of hesitant flame within them. It was a dance, a desperate plea, and a promise. As the last flame caught, I collapsed, energy seeping away. When I next opened my eyes, the villagers gasped, and even the ever-stoic bear let out a low huff of wonder. The circle was filled with light, not firelight, nor moonlight, but something that seemed the very essence of starlight woven with the first flush of dawn. And within it, a figure shimmered. The winter creature stood there, yet not as a monster, but as a woman of impossible beauty, woven from snow and woven with threads of the new light. Your offering, it stirs memory, she whispered, her voice like the first crack of thawing ice. There was another way, long past. I rose on unsteady legs, my own body a jarring mix of icy veins and a heart that pounded with a heat that felt newly precious. The dance, I said hoarsely, the endless dance. Will you step into it once more? She hesitated, then stepped out of the circle and onto the thawing ground. And as she did, the world breathed out a sigh of relief. The forest erupted in birdsong, flowers burst defiant from half-frozen soil, the river rushed with the joyful clatter of melting ice. Not the end of winter, but winter in its proper place, a vital part of the world's intricate song. Years passed with a rhythm the village found both bewildering and comforting. The winter still came, harsh but held in check, leaving space for the bursting. Vibrant summers the bear seemed to take a gruff satisfaction in. The Rusalkas sang, but their song was of melancholy beauty, not vengeful fury. I walked among the villagers, the frost-marked girl, now accepted, though never fully understood. Father Constantine's sermons took on a hesitant new tone. He still spoke of his god, but also of the spirits, the ancient powers that hummed beneath the surface of the ordinary. The Domovoi was openly honored once more, offerings left unmolested in the hearth. I never touched the intoxicating power the winter creature wielded. Instead, I became something I never expected, a listener. I listened to the forest, its rustles and murmurs translating into guidance. I listened to the villagers, their fears and small joys woven into a tapestry that taught me more about the human heart than any grand magic. I even listened to echoes of the winter creature, carried on the chill wind. They were not whispers of dominance, but of a lonely power seeking a place in a world not made for her. One day, as the first leaves turned golden, I found the old river woman's cloak by the river bank, carefully folded. It felt right, this passing of the mantle. My task now was to teach. A new generation of children looked at me not with their parents' fear, but wide-eyed wonder, and I taught them the names of the trees, the scent of coming storms, and most importantly, the power of a listening ear. One clear, cold night, guided by an instinct I couldn't name, I ventured deep into the forest with a warm cloak and a basket of simple offerings. In a clearing I knew well, under the vast starlit sky, I built a small, merry fire. And there, drawn by the promise of warmth and shared stories, the winter creature came. 
not as a queen or a monster, but as a strange, shimmering echo of a woman, seeking a flicker of companionship in her vast, icy realm. As the fire burned low, under the watchful eyes of the forest spirits, we shared tales old and new, and the girl who listened to the snow learned that even the coldest heart yearns, in its own way, for a place by the fire. Time blurs the edges of legend, years after even I had become a grandmother, weaving tales of the frost girl and the winter woman by the fireside. The changes I'd wrought were simply how the world had always been. Winters came and went, spirits were respected, and the village thrived under this uneasy, beautiful balance. Yet, my story didn't end in peaceful domesticity. There came a day when the river ran too high, not with the joyful rush of spring melt, but with a dark, churning unease. The Rusalka songs echoed with a panic discord I hadn't heard since my first nights battling their grief. It wasn't the winter creature's touch, but something older, buried deeper. The old river woman's cryptic words about the Rusalka's stolen heart echoed in my mind. Legends told of treasures sunk to the riverbed, not just coins or lost jewelry, but objects that embodied the very spirit of the river. It was a fool's quest, venturing into those dangerous depths, but fear sang in my blood a certainty that something vital was slipping away. Donning the river woman's cloak, feeling its protective magic tingle against my skin, I walked not towards the riverbank, but into the water itself. The current tugged at me, and the icy depths were a shock that threatened to steal my breath. Yet, guided by the Rusalka's mournful cries and some desperate instinct, I dove. The riverbed was a graveyard, broken wagon wheels, rusted swords, and even the bleached bones of some unlucky creature snagged at my clothes. Yet, it was the gleam amidst the mud that drew my eye. Not gold, but the pure, unwavering white of a single, large stone, smooth and heavy in my trembling hands. Breaking the surface, gasping in great gulps of air, I held my treasure aloft. The Rusalkas erupted in song, waves crashing on the shore as they wove around me in a swirling dance. As I placed the stone at the river's edge, their song changed. Not relief, but a complex harmony of gratitude, welcome, and a touch of mischief. The great stone pulsed with a soft light. It wasn't magic I could wield, but a heartbeat, echoing the river's own. And as days turned to weeks, the change became clear. The river swirled with a playful energy, fish darted in abundance, and the crops along its banks grew with a vibrancy unseen in living memory. It was as if the river itself, awoken from a long slumber, danced in joy. My legacy wasn't a tale of heroism, but something quieter, more vital. I was the one who remembered, who listened when the world itself had forgotten how to speak. My bones ached, not just with age, but with a chill the warmest fire couldn't conquer. Not the winter creature's icy touch, but the call of something beyond. As the first snows fell, that yearning became undeniable, my granddaughter, strong-willed, and with a spark of the old magic in her eyes, protested fiercely. You can't go into the forest alone, Babushka. Not alone, I chided gently, tracing the familiar frost rune on my palm. The trees remember me still. With a heavy cloak, a walking stick, and a stubborn determination that mirrored my own so many years ago, I ventured beyond the village walls. The forest greeted me not with hostility, but with the hushed reverence due an old friend. The bear's hut stood empty, yet I felt his heavy presence in the rustle of leaves, a benevolent echo in the winter wind. My steps, guided by a certainty stronger than my failing body, led me at last to the clearing where it all began. The stones pulsed with a gentle, familiar warmth beneath my touch. Sitting, surrounded by their silent support, I let the memories wash over me. The terror, the rage, the wonder, and the quiet understanding that bloomed amidst the chaos. A snowflake landed on my outstretched hand, another, then another, and soon a gentle snowstorm swirled around me. But as I watched, I realized these weren't just flakes. They shimmered with the echoes of my own runes, the songs of Rusalka's, the low rumble of the bear's wisdom. They were fragments of my journey, woven by some unseen hand into a dance of wonder and farewell. Smiling, I closed my eyes, letting the swirling stories wash over me. And perhaps it was just the cold seeping into my old woman's bones, or perhaps it was something more, 
But as the snow swirled faster, I felt myself becoming one with its dance. Not a grand spell, not a burst of power, but a gentle dissolving into the very heart of the world I had spent my life learning to hear. When my granddaughter came searching hours later, panicked by the falling dusk and swirling snow, she found the clearing empty, the ancient stones holding only the lingering warmth of my touch. But if she listened very, very carefully with her heart, not just her ears, she might just hear my laughter carried on the wind, whispering secrets to the dancing snowflakes. The whispers started long before I understood them. Not the whispers of snowflakes, but the crackle of kindling, the hiss of a flame yearning to burst free. They tugged at my dreams, filled with images of swirling embers and eyes like drops of molten gold. I was Oksana still, granddaughter of the Frost Girl, keeper of hearth and river lore. But something else stirred beneath my skin, waiting for its spark. Grandmother's tales, usually of Rusalkas and forest guardians, took a fiery turn. She told of Jarptitsa, the firebird, not with hushed awe like the winter creature, but with a glint in her eye that set my own blood thrumming. A creature of legend, heart of pure flame, feathers that painted the sunsets. Some said bringer of fortune, others of glorious ruin. One day, as the leaves surrendered to autumn's blaze, I was no longer content with tales. Guided by the pull echoing the heat in my veins, I ventured beyond the forest I knew into wilder lands. There, ancient trees wore cloaks of fiery red, and the air thrummed with restless energy. And there, perched upon a blackened branch, as if born from the ashes, was the firebird. Its gaze pierced me, a thrilling burn that mirrored the ache in my bones. This was no gentle spirit of hearth and home, but wild magic incarnate. You are not what I expected, its voice rasped, a whisper of smoke and ember. Nor you, I dared reply. The tale spoke of beauty, not this. I gestured at the charred branch, the lingering scent of wildfire. It let out a chirp that might have been laughter. Beauty is for fools. I am fire. I consume, reshape, make way for the new amidst the ashes. I was not afraid, only a light with defiant purpose. Then show me, show me your fire, not what it leaves behind. For days, it tested me, not with riddles like the bear, but with challenges, enduring a shower of searing sparks that left no mark, dancing amidst hungry flames that licked yet never burned. I learned the language of heat, the difference between warmth that nurtured and the blaze that devoured. Finally, on a hilltop as the sun dipped below the horizon, the firebird shimmered, not into splendor, but into a single, fiery feather, drifting down like a cinder towards my outstretched hand. The instant it touched my skin, it ignited. But this was no pain, only an answering fire blooming within me, wild and joyous. The world turned to shades of flame and shadow, and in my veins, alongside the echo of winter, ran the joyful burn of a power just unfurling its wings. Returning home was a clash of ice and flame. Grandmother, once indomitable, now stooped with worry. Her gaze flickered between my feather-shaped burn mark and the familiar frost runes on my skin. The villagers whispered again, not a fear this time, but a superstitious awe that chafed against the warmth thrumming beneath my skin. Even Father Constantine, always quick to condemn, fell strangely silent. They expected me to leave, to follow the firebird into its untamed lands. But Grandmother had taught me that true power lay not in dominion, but in understanding my place in the greater dance. This fire wasn't a replacement, but a new step to learn. Yet, I could no longer tend the river with the same quiet focus. The Rusalkas, sensing the shift in me, trilled not their haunting melodies, but warbling songs of distant shores and storms at sea, songs that felt like a dare. There was a restlessness in the wind now, a scent of change that wasn't the turning of the seasons. The call came not on the wind this time, but by way of a soot-stained raven crashing through my window. Around its leg was a scrap of parchment, its plea written not in words, but in the image of a village consumed by swirling, unnatural flame. Not the blue of winter magic, but a ravenous, uncontrolled red. Grandmother's sigh echoed the weight of weary prophecy. You must go. This is your fire to fight, your path to walk. With her blessing, the river woman's cloak, 
and a heart both blazing with determination and flickering with dread, I followed the raven's flight. The journey stretched for days. The forests grew sparser, the air tinged with the stench of old fires. Finally, I stumbled into a scene out of a nightmare, where a village should have stood were only blackened husks and swirling smoke. Not a single living soul, yet the fire, a roiling, crimson beast, still raged in the center. And circling above it, casting monstrous shadows in the flickering light, was the firebird, or something twisted in its image. Its feathers were the color of dried blood. Its eyes held a mad, insatiable hunger. This was not natural creation, but corruption. A power meant to dance with the world, now consuming it. Rage blazed through me, hotter than any fire. This was my kin, even if warped. And what monster dared lay waste to what that kinship should mean? Drawing on the river woman's protective magic, I stepped into the inferno. Heat seared my skin, smoke choked my lungs. Yet through it all, I focused not on the flames, but on the song beneath them. It was a discordant symphony of pain and twisted power. The firebird shrieked and swooped. But each strike was not a predator's, but a wounded creature lashing out at a world it no longer understood. And beneath that rage was a thrumming rhythm of loss, a forgotten melody of creation it clung to like a shattered eggshell. The villagers had seen me only as a strange girl marked by old forces. What they never understood was that these runes, this power, it wasn't about casting spells, but about listening, echoing, and answering. As I pushed deeper into the fiery heart of the village, my footsteps fell into a hesitant rhythm, echoing the firebird's song. The creature paused mid-dive, its glowing eyes narrowing. Not fear, but the startled flicker of recognition. I raised my hands. The frost runes blazed with a light I'd never summoned, but in that light was not ice, but reflection. The shimmer of a morning pond, the gentle warmth trapped in freshly fallen snow. A reminder. The firebird shrieked, a cry that held both anguish and a flicker of something lost. It spiraled upwards, flames swirling around it not as weapons, but as a shield from the world, and from itself. I didn't pursue, didn't raise ice against fire in some epic duel. Instead, I knelt amidst the ashes, and I began to sing. Not a Rusalka's lament, nor the bear's low hum of the earth, but a song my grandmother used to sing to me as a child. A simple melody of the sun after a storm, of green shoots pushing through charred earth. It was a song not of control, but of resilience, of the quiet. Stubborn beauty that endures even in the shadow of destruction. Slowly, so slowly the crimson flames around the firebird began to shift, not extinguishing, but softening. Blues and flecks of gold wove through the red, echoing my own frost and fire markings. Its cry lessened to a ragged chirp, mirroring the hesitant cadence of my tune. When the last note faded, the creature spiraled down, unsteady but transformed. It landed before me, its feathers no longer the color of blood, but of fading embers. And in its eye, beneath the rage, there was a question. It was the question of a broken beginning, of a second chance, and of a dance of creation that needed both our steps to find its way again. From the girl touched by ice to the keeper of the flame, Oksana forged her own legend, and though the dangers were great and the path unseen, she proved that courage and compassion can reshape a world. So listen close, for the winds still carry her tale, a song of the firebird and the winter witch, and the magic that blooms when we embrace the extraordinary within ourselves.